This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to Insight Ophthalmology. As we all know that we are discussing the diabetic retinopathy series and today in this lecture we shall be discussing a very important topic that is diabetic macular edema, its classifications, pathophysiology and the various symptoms. So what is meant by the diabetic macular edema? The macular edema which is occurring in diabetes also called as the DME was actually unrecognized before the invention of this instrument which is the ophthalmoscope which is usually used to look at the retina of the eye. Later Jagger was the first to describe these roundish or oval yellow spots which are seen in the retina and he described that these are present in the whole thickness of retina and he actually correlated the presence of these yellowish spots to a patient of diabetes mellitus who had a positive urine glucose test. So this marked the invention or the discovery of diabetic macular edema. Diabetic macular edema is actually the retinal thickening which is caused by accumulation of the intraretinal fluid which is primarily located in the inner and outer plexiform layers. This basically happens because of the hyperpermeability or you can say excessive leakage of the retinal vasculature. So as the retinal vasculature becomes leaky, it will cause accumulation of the fluid within the layers of the retina. And this leads to the diabetic macular edema, which is nothing but swelling of the uh, macula of the eye seen in diabetic patients. Now, the diabetic macular edema, as I told you in my video on classification and stages of diabetic uh, retinopathy, can be present with any level of diabetic retinopathy. It can be present along with the NPDR and it can also be present with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So what are the risk factors and association for developing the diabetic macular edema? Number one is duration of diabetes. Longer is the duration of diabetes. Along with poor glycemic control, there is more risk of getting diabetic macular edema. Similarly, patients who already are suffering from diabetic nephropathy, they are also at a greater risk of developing diabetic uh, macular edema. That means patients with diabetes who are already having, having proteinuria, and they are having more risk of developing the diabetic retinopathy. Similarly, hypertension, dyslipidemia that is poor cholesterol control and poor cholesterol levels in the body can also lead to diabetic uh, retinopathy and along with that diabetic macular edema. Pregnancy, a patient who is diabetic with diabetic retinopathy and who becomes pregnant during that time, uh, it, it has been seen that the, uh, the severity of the diabetic macular edema is more during the pregnancy and sometimes the pregnancy hormones can actually deteriorate the diabetic retinopathy and can lead to the development of diabetic macular edema. Now, patients who are diabetic, when they undergo any kind of intraocular surgery, whether it is a cataract extraction or any other intraocular surgery, they are at a greater risk of developing macular edema post-surgery. Similarly, patients with diabetic retinopathy who develop uveitis, that is the inflammation of the eye, they also have a greater chance of developing diabetic macular edema, that is DME. Now, why does the diabetic macular edema happen? So that means, what is the pathophysiology of diabetic macular edema? Now, there are basically three major mechanisms that causes diabetic macular edema. If you want to know in detail about the pathophysiology of diabetic macular edema, just look at my video which is present the first video of the diabetic retinopathy series where I explain the perspective of the pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy. For the purpose of this video, let me summarize the pathophysiology of diabetic macular edema as follows. There are basically three mechanisms. Number one is the passive egress of the fluid due to the capillary hydrostatic pressure. That means there are capillaries which are present in the retina, we know, and just because of the pressure of the blood which is flowing through these capillaries, the uh, fluid is going to come out of these capillaries passively without any force and therefore it is called passive egress of the fluid. Number two reason is 
the breakdown of the inner and outer blood retinal barriers. We know the inner retinal barrier is formed by the endothelial cells and their tight junctions of the capillaries and the outer blood retinal barrier is formed by the retinal pigment epithelium. These two barriers prevent uh, the penetration of any fluid within the retina. However, when they get broken down because of the inflammation which is seen in diabetic retinopathy and because of the VEGF that is vascular endothelial growth factor which is an anti which is a angiogenic growth factor it will lead to accumulation of the fluid leading to swelling of the macula leading to diabetic macular edema the third component of pathophysiology is traction that means at the uh, junction of vitreous and the retina that is called the vitreomacular interface over there if we have any membrane which is pulling the um, uh, macula for upwards Okay, whether it, it is an ERM or any focal traction that can create additional space because of the pull on the macula and that is called that space can again in turn get filled up with the fluid and this is called tractional diabetic macular edema because of the problems of the vitromacular interface that is the junction between the vitreous and the macula. So this picture actually summarizes the three uh, the three mechanisms of pathophysiology that we have discussed. So the fluids, uh, this fluid can come up just like that from the uh, vessels which is called the passive egress or the vessels themselves as we know they will become more leaky and therefore the microorganisms and damaged capillaries will actually cause leakage and there will be more fluid which is accumulating. That leakage is coming because of damage of the inner blood retinal barrier. Similarly, the outer blood retinal barrier, which is the RPE cells, these might also get damaged and the fluid is now going to come from the choroidal capillaries across the retinal pigment epithelium and gets accumulated in the retina and this will lead to a swollen retina. Similarly, if you have a membrane over here attached, this membrane is going to pull the retina upwards, creating potential space and that potential space is going to get filled up with fluid, which is called the traction diabetic macular edema so this is the OCT OCT is showing various fluid accumulation this is actually a cystoid macular edema in a patient with diabetic macular edema or diabetic retinopathy so what are the various symptoms that the patient is going to uh, go through when he or she is actually suffering with diabetic macular edema? A patient with diabetic retinopathy, when he's complaining of blurred vision, and especially with metamorphopsias, you should suspect diabetic macular edema. So what is meant by metamorphopsias? Metamorphopsias is nothing but whenever there's alteration in the normal shape of an object, it is called metamorphopsia. For example, if a patient is supposed to see a normal patient, patient looking at this tree bark or tree stem would actually look at it as a straight line whereas a, pe a person who is having diabetic macular edema because of the swelling of the retina and because of the photoreceptors which are getting displaced so normally we know the photoreceptors are arranged like this now as the fluid develops um, in that area of the retina the pho photoreceptors are also going to get displaced in such a way that there will be alteration in the perception of the shapes also of the various objects and this alteration in the shape of the object is called as metamorphopsias. So instead of seeing a straight line, they are going to see it as a curved line or a bend line and this is called uh, metamorphopsias which is which indicates that there is a macular pathology and specifically if the patient is diabetic, you might suspect a diabetic macular edema. Then again, they will have difficulty in reading with color perception altered because we know in the fovea or in the macula, we have lots of cones which are present. And uh, to tell you that the cones density is maximum in the macula. And as the macular edema happens, there might be a difficulty in the color perception also of the patient. Or sometimes the patient might be uh, not showing any signs and symptoms of diabetic macular edema. Now, the most common uh, grid that we actually give to patients who are suffering with diabetic, uh, diabetic retinopathy and even the patients who are suffering with ARMD specifically is the Amsler grid, which is given to the patient, uh, which consists of these horizontal and vertical lines. And these, the patient is actually asked to look at these horizontal and vertical lines every day and report any alteration in these lines. So patients who are 
actually suffering with diabetic macular edema might report rounding or alteration in the shape of these lines and you might and that is when they're supposed to come back to doctor for the screening and that is when the doctor will actually diagnose diabetic macular edema so this is all based on the principle of metamorphopsias which indicates that there is a macular pathology now coming to how do you classify the diabetic macular edema now there are various classifications of diabetic macular edema so uh, so basically to avoid confusion i would go with them one by one now a first very cl important clinical term which uh, represents the diabetic macular edema which was actually given by the edtr study is the clinically significant macular edema also referred to as the csme now what is meant by csme for the presence of clinically significant macular edema there should be actually three parameters either of these three should be present for a patient to be labeled um, for a patient to have actually csme type of diabetic macular edema number one is thickening of the retina now when i told you about the diabetic macular edema it is swelling of the retina and whenever there's swelling what is happening there's fluid which is accumulating and because of the fluid which is accumulating there is also thickening of the normal layers of the retina so this is called thickening okay so number one point is there should be thickening present at or within 500 microns from the center of the macula okay so what you need to remember is that if you draw a circle like this considering it to be retina and this is in the center you have uh, the uh, you in the center you have the macula and then from the fovea from there you have to draw a circle of about 500 microns okay within this cir circle 500 microns okay and which is uh, centered onto the fovea so if the thickening is present if any part of the thickening or the thickening is present within this 500 micrometers then it is clinically significant macular edema so i would explain it to you with uh, some diagrams also in a short while number second uh, point second point is that presence of hard exudates at or within 500 micrometers from the center of macula again you consider uh, this to be the center of macula and you draw a circle of 500 micrometers from the circle uh, from the center of the macula and if you have hard exudates which are present within this circle of the macula provided those hard exudates are accompanied by thickening of the adjacent retina so you also need certain area of thickening of the adjacent retina along with the hard exudates um, present within the 500 micrometers from the center of the macula the third feature or the third important point is any zone of retinal thickness which is about one disc area and you know the disc area is about 1500 micrometers okay or larger in size which is located one disc diameter or less from the center of the macula so now if you draw over here this is the fovea and you can see we have drawn a circle the circle is about one disc diameters okay from the disc so initially in the first two criteria we were actually considering a circle of 500 micrometers but for the third criteria we're considering a circle of 1500 micrometers okay and that is considered to be about one disc area right so if there's a thickening and that thickening size is also at least one disc area and any part of that thickening is present with this within this circle then also the patient is said to be uh, having clinically significant macular edema so let us revise in the first criteria of clinically significant macular edema the patient should have this retinal thickening and any part of this retinal thickening should be present in this circle of about 500 micrometers centered on the fovea so this is your first criteria for csme the second criteria of csme is the hard exudates okay so hard exudates which are present within this 500 micrometer circle centered on the fovea provided those hard exudates are present with an adjacent area of retinal thickening okay so this is the thickening and these are the hard exudates and they are present within the circle of 500 micrometers then also the patient is said to have csme the third criteria is that maybe those what if uh, it basically suggests that what if there's no retinal thickening and what if the retinal thickening is not falling within 500 micrometers but it's a large thickening or what if the thickening is not accompanied with hard exudates okay 
so but it's still a, hard, a big thickening so for that we have the third criteria so in the third criteria if we have a thickening which is pretty large almost equal to the disc area and it is present sorry the circle is too large but we have to consider a circle centered on the macula and the diameter of that circle should be almost equal to this one disc area okay and any part of this thickening if it is present within this area which is about 1500 micrometers then also it is said to be having csme okay so in the, for the third criteria the thickening size is considered and the thickening size is pretty big at least about 1500 micrometers so i hope this is very clear to you csme what is csme and what are the three criteria for csme this is a very very important topic now the next not so important topic but what i want you to know is the international council of ophthalmology classification of the diabetic macular edema according to the international council of ophthalmology they have classified the diabetic macular edema based upon the dila dilated ophthalmoscopy in which if we don't have any retinal thickening or hard exudates in the macula it is no dme right then we have two features one uh, the two categories one is the non-central involved diabetic macular edema and central involving diabetic macular edema for this what they consider is that if there is retinal thickening in the macula that does not involve the central subfield zone that is one millimeter in diameter centered on the fovea now if you want to know what is cs zone or the central subfield zone you have to refer to my video on the OCT, uh, especially the macular anatomy of OCT and how to read a macular OCT scan. So in that I have explained to you, right? So if that central subfield zone, which is about one millimeter in diameter in the ETDRS circle, if that is not involved, then it is non-center involving diabetic macular edema, which is not very severe however if the central subfield zone which is about one millimeter in diameter that also gets involved then it is center involving diabetic macular edema which is more dangerous okay so now just have a look at this so this is the edtrs circle over here and you can see the central circle here this is a 1 mm circle so if you see the red zone okay that is not really involving the central circle in the first picture so this is non-center involving and you can see certain uh, hard exudates which are not exactly present in the central 500 micrometer so this is not even csma now in the second picture you can see the thickening is actually involving the uh, central 1 mm zone also and you can see the hard exudates approaching the macular area so this is the center involving diabetic macular edema now based on uh, what we have seen just now another drcr group okay which is called drcr net they gave certain recommendation based on that central subfield thickness for the treatment threshold okay and what did they say that uh, for various OST machines, there are various parameters and various thresholds for the CST uh, above which we will actually start treatment for the patient. So if you're using a Heidelberg Spectralis, the cutoff for treatment for men will be 320 micrometers and for women will be 305. So what I mean to say is the central 1 mm zone. Okay, what is the value which is written over there? So for the Zycerus, it is 305 and 290. And for the Stratus OCT, it is 250 for both men and women. So you can see for the Spectralis, it is usually more compared to the Cirrus and the Stratus. And these are the treatment thresholds, okay, based on the sex match standards. So this is the circle and over here you will have the readings. Okay, so as you can see in this macular cube, macular thickness uh, profile, you can see in the center over here is the thickness which is given about 324 and this is actually the cirrus one so definitely it is more than 305 so definitely it warrants the treatment for the patient now how to read a retinal macular ocd printout this video is present on the channel so all of you are advised to visit that video the third type of classification is the International Clinical DME Disease Severity Scale. So it's just a scale dividing it into mild, moderate, severe. It's not very useful clinically. However, it's given by Wilkinson. Now, the mild diabetic macular edema means that there is some retinal thickening or hard exudates in the posterior pole, but it is very distant from the macula. This is like if you don't have an OCD, you can just look at the ophthalmoscopy and you can uh, label it as mild, moderate, severe. Now, moderate means retinal thickening or hard exudates, which is approaching the center, 
but has not yet involved the center and severe is when it is actually involving the center of the macula then after oct there is another classification which is based upon the ffa that is fundus floris and angiography okay now if you're totally clueless about ffa which i think you are not you are advised to uh, visit my video on ffa which is present on the channel for the basic idea and then you can go uh, come back to this video to study the ffa classification of diabetic macular edema now on ffa we divided into ischemic and non ischemic macular edema and under the non ischemic macular edema we have focal and diffuse variety of diabetic macular edema now in the focal variety of diabetic macular edema usually there are focal areas of leakage or hyperpermeability and usually these focal areas will be the leaking microaneurysms so sometimes there will be a microaneurysm like this which is leaking so as you can see over here there are multiple microaneurysms that you can see which are becoming hyperfluorescent and these high micro uh, aneurysms are focal areas of leakage then sometimes you might not be able to see the microaneurysm you might just see a diffuse area of thickening and you will not have a very well demarcated leakage so as you can see over here this is a very poorly demarcated area of leakage over here okay you can't really tell from which area is it leaking okay so this is called a diffuse kind of uh, dme okay now sometimes uh, you uh, there will be enlargement of the foveal avascular zone so what is meant by foveal avascular zone it's a zone which is centered on to the fovea centralis of the macula which is devoid of any blood vessels so in a particular part of the macula near the fovea which is about 0.5 mm we do not have any blood vessels since it does not have any blood vessel it is called a foveal avascular zone and it corresponds to about 1.5 degrees of our visual field now when we do an ffa and you find out that this area you can see it is much bigger okay it's almost equal to the size of the disc and more than the size of the disc and i told you that the size of the disc is about 1500 micrometers so definitely this foveal avascular zone is increased in size and you can see so many gaps with non perfusion areas so this is a type of ischemic okay since the blood supply is decreased and you can see foveal avascular zone increased this is an ischemic diabetic macular edema so let us summarize these ffa types of macular edema so we have a non ischemic and then we have an ischemic okay under the non ischemic we have focal and diffuse under focal there will be well circumscribed retinal thickening associated with a complete ring of exudates so you saw there was a leaking microaneurysm and around that we had a circinate exudate right an ffa you will see late but focal hyperfluorescence due to the leakage but usually the macular perfusion will be normal and therefore your foveal avascular zone will be normal in size in diffuse uh, macular edema of non ischemic variety you will have a diffuse retinal thickening okay and that will show a late diffuse hyperfluorescence and sometime there will be cma also present in which we will have a flower pet uh, petal pattern now in the ischemic variety of diabetic macular edema sometimes it might actually look very normal but when you do a foveal uh, fundus floris and angiography you will see various non perfusion areas at the fovea and you will see an enlarged foveal uh, vascular zone now why is it all important because it has some role in the treatment according to the ETDRS that is early treatment of diabetic retinopathy study it says that if there is a focal leak uh, especially in non ischemic variety you can do an ffa guided focal laser whereas if there's a diffuse leak you can do a grid laser however when there's ischemia there's usually no loan no role for the laser now if you want me to do a video on laser in diabetic macular edema or diabetic retinopathy kindly comment in the comment section for me to know that it will be useful for you so that's all for today i hope it was useful if it was kindly share the knowledge like and subscribe thank you and have a nice day and this is the topic for our next video